Anika, you may start. Okay. Hello, everyone. A very good morning and namaskar to all from CSIR NIST, Jorhat, Assam, India. I, Anvesha Datta Hazarika, a research scholar of this institute, extend warm welcome to you all to the inaugural ceremony of the second international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics. It is really an honor and privilege for me to welcome our honorable director of CSI NIST, Dr. G. Narahari Shastri, sir, renowned geophysicist, Dr. Andrew G. Michael of United States Geological Survey as our chief guest, as chief executive officer of Assam State Disaster Management Authority, Mr. G. D. Tripathi as the guest of honor, Dr. G. R. Kayal, former Deputy Director General of Geological Survey of India, Mr. Mukul Saxena, Deputy General Manager of NHIDCL, Daniela Kuhn of Norwegian Seismic Array, Professor Daping Zhao of Tohoku University, Japan, Sebastiano Di Amico from University of Malta, Dr. Sara Borwa, Chief Scientist of CSR NIST, Distinguished Speakers, Research scholars, esteemed participants, and guests who have joined us for this virtual workshop from across the world. Thank you very much for joining us today for the opening ceremony of the second international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics. This virtual event is organized by the Geo Geoscience and Technology Division of CSR NIST Jorhat on the auspices of the Diamond Jubilee celebration of CSIR Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, Jorhat, that the institute is organizing around the year through a series of events. We are indeed grateful to Dr. Shekhar C. Mande, uh, sir, and CSIR for permitting us to organize this virtual workshop. I, on behalf of the organizing committee of International Virtual Workshop on Global Seismology and Tectonics 2021 extend our sincere gratitude to our Honorable Director, Sir Dr. G. Narahari Shastri, for his continuous support and guidance under whose patronage this workshop has become a reality. It is a great honor for us that almost 22 eminent speakers will be delivering talks during this entire workshop it also gives me immense pleasure to mention that over 1,700 participants representing 42 countries from diverse domains within and beyond the field of seismology and tectonics have registered for this virtual workshop. The first edition of this international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics was successfully organized from 14th to 20th 25th of September 2020, in a humble attempt of the Geoscience and Technology Division of CSIR NIST. During the time when the world was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and the traditional modes of communication were scientific communication were disrupted. Therefore, virtual platforms were adopted to conduct IBWGST 2020 in order to sustain a degree of scientific communication during the challenging times. The first edition of this virtual workshop was a great success, which was attended by many internationally recognized scientists and speakers and witnessed the active participation of around 1,025 participants representing 30 countries across the globe. This achievement motivated us to organize the second edition of this international workshop in an enhanced and improved version this year. And we look forward to more active participation from all the participants this year. The entire work webinar are, uh, will be conducted through Microsoft Teams. Uh, though we will try our best to conduct the workshop without any issue, there may be instances of technical glitches beyond our control for which we would appreciate everyone's patience and cooperation. Let us together make it a grand success. Now let me proceed further with the schedule of today's program. 
Uh, now may I request our Honorable Director Sir, Dr. G. Narahari Shastri to provide his initial remarks. Over to you, Dr. G. Narahari Shastri, sir. Due to technical issue, uh, Director Sir is unable to join us. So now uh, may I request our today's chief guest, Dr. Andrew J. Michael, who is a well-known seismologist from the United States Geological Survey to deliver a few words on this special occasion. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I am so happy to be here and very honored to be involved with this impressive workshop. During the last 18 months, we've all sought ways to continue working through the pandemic. Many meetings have gone online, but our colleagues in Assam have created the most impressive response. This international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics. And that is shown by having such an amazing participation of 1800 people from over 40 countries. Truly, this is an amazing opportunity for us to share information around the world. And our colleagues have succeeded despite living through their own lockdowns for COVID-19 and dealing with the impact of a magnitude six earthquake in April of this year. Their dedication to this project is amazing. We all owe our gratitude to our colleagues in the Geoscience and Technology Division of CSER, Northeast Institute of Science and Technology. In particular, I thank Dr. Sastry, the director, and Dr. Santano Barua, the convener of this workshop. It has been my pleasure to consult with Dr. Barua for many years, ever since he was a graduate student. And so it is very special to me to work with him and the amazing team he has assembled for this workshop. I was glad to suggest a few of the talks, but when I look at the program, I see the impact of the advice from the other advisors, session chairs, conveners, and the organizing committee. I am very impressed by the program and greatly looking forward to all of the talks. We would not have this opportunity without the hard work of the editorial members, the technical quiz and certificate committees. These are the people who make it all work. Thank you to each and every one of you. And now I look forward to the workshop. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, may I uh, request our today's guest of honor, Mr. G.D. Tripathi, Chief Executive Officer of Assam State Disaster Management Authority to deliver a few words on this occasion. Over to you, sir. Sir, uh, may I request Mr. G. D. Tripathi to say a few words on this occasion? Okay, I think G. D. Tripathi has went offline. Uh, now, uh, I would like to request. Uh, Mr. Mukul Saxena from NHIDCL, uh, who is the Deputy General Manager, uh, to provide his initial remarks. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dr. G. Narari Sastri, Director, and the CSR, and Mr. Dr. Shantanu Barua for inviting me to this international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics. I am delighted to know that the first edition of this international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics uh, was met with a huge success with attendance from about 30 countries. And I'm optimistic that the second edition also will succeed in engaging the people from the realm of seismology and tectonics. I came to know that about 1,800 participants from 42 countries are participating in this workshop. Very recently, I 
would also like to mention that we collaborated with CSIR and IST Durant and completed a mega project of conducting geophysical investigations in the construction site of the underground tunnel connecting Gopur to Namaligarh, beneath of the Brahmaputra River. Our company would be glad to work in association with the CSIR NEST in the future as well as for such joint projects. At the end, I thank the organizing committee of this event for bringing out such an innovative idea and putting it into action of conducting a workshop of this stature. Where so many eminent persons from the field of cosmology and technology will be interacting with the enthusiastic participant. And I hope that CSIR NEST Jurat continues to be the leading institute of the region in performing groundbreaking research activities. I wish the team all the very best, best and may this event turn out to be an even bigger, bigger success than before. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, may I request our honorable session advisor and special guest, Professor Daping Zhao, who is a renowned geophysicist and currently a professor at Tohoku University, Japan, to say a few words. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is uh, Daping Zhao from Japan, and uh, I'm very happy to attend this international workshop, and I'm very happy to see you. First, I would like to thank the organizer of this workshop, in particular, Dr. Santanu Barun, who helped me a lot for my attending this workshop. Uh, you are really doing a great and a very important, excellent work by organizing this uh, international workshop. Uh, I heard that the first workshop last year was very successful. I wish and believe that this second workshop will be even more successful. I think all of us will enjoy the lectures and the discussions in the coming 10 days. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Now, may I request our special guest, Dr. Daniela Kuhn, a senior researcher at Norwegian Seismic Array, to deliver a few words. Over to you, ma'am. Yes, I hope you can hear me now. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation to this workshop and congratulations on having this created this very amazing opportunity. It's really an impressive response to have uh, 1800 attendees from 42 countries. The response was already impressive last year, but even has increased this year. That is really amazing. Uh, and thank you all for caring for the students despite the pandemic and continuing their education. I think education is a very important building stone for the development of any country on this world. Thank you to NIST for organizing this workshop, especially Santa Nubarua for inviting me. So it's a long time that we could see each other in person, but I'm very glad to have this continued contact to NIST. Thanks also to the director of NIST for um, allowing for this opportunity. Thanks for all other to all other lecturers and of course also a special thank you to the organizers and all helpers in organizing this. Thanks also to the students that attend these workshops and are interested in this very broad forum on diverse uh, topics on seismology and tectonics. So I will be happy to deliver my lecture on Wednesday to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Now, may I request our guest, Dr. Sebastiano Diamico from University of Malta to say a few words. Over to you, sir. I think he's not available. Now, may I request uh, Dr. Saraburva, sir, the chief scientist of, of CSI NIST, Jorhat, to say a few words on this occasion. Over to you, sir.
thank you, Dr. Anisha. Honorable Director, Dr. G. Narahari Sastri. Dr. Andrew Michael, Dr. Mukul Saxena, Dr. Dapeng Jao, Dr. Daniel Aku, Professor J.R. Kayal, Dr. Sebastiano Amico, and all my dear participants. This is the second time CSIR NEAST under the leadership of Dr. Sastri as a convenership of Dr. Shantanu under the guidance of our very long friend, Professor Andrew J. Michael from USGS USA. We are organizing this kind of meeting. First meeting was a grand success with the participations of more than thousands of people throughout the world. And there was 30 odd countries participants from 30 odd countries they participated. Very interestingly, why Geoscience and Technology Division has chosen this particular seminar with the theme of global seismology and the tectonics. The very reason is we are situated in a place where Himalaya is just 20 kilometers away. Indo-Myanmar subduction zone is just 50 kilometers away. Shillong Plateau, which is around say 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers away. And this is the seat of two great earthquakes of 1897 and 1950. 20 large earthquakes of 7.5 above are the seat of this particular place. And daily, our monitoring system records at least on an average 10 smaller magnitude earthquake. So this is the situation where we are staying, where we are surviving, where we are trying to understand the geodynamics underneath. I really appreciate the effort of Dr. Shantanu Barua and his team to organize such kind of meeting under the umbrella of GSTD, bringing all the laureates, bringing all the laureates right from the lecturers, 20 great lecturers who has really contributed to the field of seismology in a single platform. For these students, for the researchers like us, it was indeed a very praiseworthy effort. And the even more praiseworthy effort is that Professor Andrew J. Michael, Professor J. R. Kayal, Dr. Daniela Kuhn, and Professor Daping Chao. They have energized, they have advised how to proceed forward with this kind of mega event. So I'll not take much time. I wish our team, GSTD, a very happy international seminar, and we look forward to a really fruitful effort in this venture. Thank you once again for your kind participation. Over to Anisha. Thank you, sir. Now, may I request Professor G.R. Kayal, former Deputy Director General of Geological Survey of India, to deliver a few words. Over to you, sir. I think he is not available. Uh, so now I'd like to request Ms. Uh, Dr. Manoj Kumar Fukon, a senior scientist of CSI NEAST, to say a few words on this occasion. Over to you, sir.
Hello, good morning, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Good morning again. And it's a great occasion for us uh, to assemble here through a version would do. And respected uh, directors are CSR NIST, uh, Jean Arhari Sasti, our esteemed guest, Andrew Michael, Professor uh, Depang Zhao, and all other eminent personalities present here, all other participants. We are indeed very, very happy to organize this event. And uh, in uh, uh, a pandemic situation where physical mode of communication is very difficult nowadays, so uh, this virtual platform is, uh, I think, good enough for us to share our, our experience, our new ideas and knowledge and I am hopeful that this event will also be great success uh, like the previous event. So I wish uh, all the best and uh, and uh, looking forward to listen all the great uh, deliberations uh, from the uh, speakers. Thank you. Again, wish a great success of this event. Over to Andesa. Thank you, sir. So, uh, to, uh, Director Sir was unable to attend uh, as he was unable to log in today for this inaugural ceremony. Uh, so, we um, the release of the abstract volume of this second international virtual workshop uh, on global seismology and tectonics 2021 was to be unveiled uh, on behalf of our honorable director, sir. So as he's absent, we would uh, conduct uh, this unveiling of the e-abstract volume later. So uh, with this, we have come to the end of today's inaugural ceremony. So uh, thank you to all the esteemed dignitaries and honorable guests who were present with us uh, and all the esteemed participants uh, who have joined us for the inaugural ceremony of today's occasion. Uh, thank you to our chief guest, uh, Dr. Andrew J. Michael of United States Geological Survey, our Honorable Director, Dr. Jean Arahari Shastri, sir, Chief Executive Officer of ASDMA, Mr. G. D. Tripathi, uh, Professor G. R. Kayal, former Deputy Director General of Geological Survey of India, renowned geophysicist Professor Daping Zhao of Tohoku University, uh, Professor Daniela Kuhn of Norser, Dr. Sebastiano Di Amico from Malta University, then Saurabh Borwa, sir, uh, Chief Scientist of GSTD, CSR NIST, and all the distinguished speakers, research scholars, and participants who have joined us for this workshop. And also Mukul Saxena of NHIDCL. So now, before proceeding for the technical session, we would have a break of two minutes. Uh, so now we will thank you. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes. yes. I think I think it's good. Okay.
Now we would like to proceed further with her today's technical session. Now may I request Dr. Shantanu Borwa to proceed uh, and introduce our today's speakers for the technical session. Over to you, sir. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce our uh, first speaker, Dr. Andrew J. Michael from USGS. He has been a geophysicist with the US Geological Service Arctic Science Center in uh, Menlo Park since 1986. Dr. Michael did his graduation in 1981 from the prestigious MIT and masters in 1983 from another prestigious institute, Stanford University. From the same university, he pursued and completed his PhD in the year 1986. He has authored more than 100 papers and reports, including publication in renowned journals such as Science, Nature, Nature Geoscience, Journal of Geophysical Research, etc. He was the editor in chief of the Bulletin of Seismological Society of America from 2004 to 2010 and served on the Society's Board of Directors from 2014 to 2019. And he was also president from 2017 to 2018. In 2011, for that work, he received the Society's Distinguished Service Award. For his career contributions, he was given the Department of Interior's Distinguished Service Award in 19, uh, 2019. He currently worked on USGS Arctic Probabilities and Occurrence Project, the Indus Seismicity Project, the Working Group for California Arctic Probabilities, and is a member of the National Arctic Prediction Evaluation Council. Let me wrap up here and request Dr. Andrew J. Michael to take over a digital space and enlighten us all with your lecture. Now over to Professor Andrew J. Michael. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brewer. Okay, I will uh, go ahead. Let me see if I can share my screen and get started. Um, Okay, so my talk tonight is on essentially when do we need to include clustering in probabilistic seismic hazards assessments? But the, the background for the talk is very much what you see in the background of this slide, which is the Kilauea caldera, which is very large and goes almost to the horizon, but then this inner collapse that took place in 2018. This was a very spectacular uh, geological event that inspired this work. I want to acknowledge uh, not only first my uh, co-author, Andrea Lenos, who I work with many, many times, and um, a number of papers, a couple of papers have already been submitted from, from what we're presenting tonight, and some more will probably come out of it as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge a lot of people at the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, um, the Volcano Science Center, um, the Geologic Science Center, where our national seismic hazard maps are made, and some people who have studied the Kilauea volcano for a long time, Fred Klein and Tom Wright, and um, advice and knowledge from Jack Baker um, at Stanford on PSHA. So we, none of us do any of this alone. So to, to orient people, so here's the Pacific Ocean, and you may very well be familiar with where Hawaii is, and it is part of a chain of, of um, islands and then seamounts where we can actually track the motion of the Pacific plate. And the thing that really amazes me about Hawaii is we so often are talking about millimeters or um, centimeters of motion a year. But in Hawaii, there are times when things are moving at meters a day. And um, not only do we track the slow plate motions with the Hawaiian and em Islands and Emperor Seamounts, but we also um, have a great laboratory for seeing the Earth deform very, very fast. So in 2018, there was an eruption that started here at Kilauea Caldera, which is at an elevation of around a thousand meters. Um, but the lava, most of the lava actually went underground through this rift zone and then in red came out in this area, which is actually populated and people did indeed lose their homes, um, which is you know common in Hawaii when there are eruptions. 
And but what I really like to talk about today is the collapse of the caldera. <clears throat> so I want to play a quick video. So this is actually taken from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, which is very close. And it's going to go from April 14th to August 20th in 23 seconds. Um, and you're going to see this initial caldera here. Um, this is the inner caldera, what's known as Hale Mau Mau. Um, and for the ancient Hawaii, for the Hawaiians, this is the home of Pele, the goddess of the volcanoes. And you'll watch it collapse um, over these few months. So you can see that it's starting to be active and smoking and ash explosions are coming off. And now it really just starts dropping out of sight. And um, you can't even see the bottom of it anymore because it's actually dropped about 450 meters in all. And because that's so spectacular, I have to um, try to play it again for you. So it only takes 23 seconds to watch, but you know, imagine this is at, at times on the daily drops that were taking place, it was dropping 10 meters at a time. Um, so this is this is uh, earth deformation at a speed we don't usually imagine. And you can just see this this fault scarp opening up here um, to a height of about 100 meters in the background of this video. OK, so if we look at it from overhead, this is a LIDAR image. Um, here's the initial um, Howling Mau Mau crater, the broader Kilauea caldera that I'm outlining with the red laser. Um, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory is here. Um, I'll later use this seismic station that's a little further from the crater rim, UWE. And um, now I'm going to show you, this is before the eruptions took place. This is after the collapse. And you can see it's a dramatic difference. And um, this is um, really amazing. If you look at the cross sections in elevation, this is from, as I said, it's about a thousand meters up here above sea level. Um, that between the 2009 survey and the 2018 survey, it drops on the order of four to 500 meters. I have to say that this amazes me because I've hiked all the way across this before the collapse. <laughs> and it was very, very flat. And it was a long, hard hike because you're, you're walking on hard, solidified um, basalt. And it just really wears on you. But now we would have to go down scarps of 100 to 200 meters. It would be impossible. And so this is territory I know very well. Um, and, you know, it, it, it really moves me to, to see the ch these changes. Now I want to show you a little bit about the earthquakes that accompanied this collapse. So if we, we're going to listen to this, um, this is now using a seismometer here on the other rim from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory. And I'm going to show you a video where we're going to go through in time. And there's a magnitude 6.9 earthquake and its aftershocks that actually happened down near where all the lava came out. And you'll hear this is a very sharp percussive event. Um, but then when we get to these caldera collapse earthquakes, you'll hear them as sort of lower booms. They were deficient in the very high frequencies. They're not really slip on faults. They're actually some sort of implosion that allowed the caldera to drop each day. The actual slip on the ring faults around the caldera collapse was largely a seismic. So I am going to get out of PowerPoint, um, hopefully smoothly. Um, uh, there we go. This is just taking a moment. Um, and I'm going to share um, instead um, another window. Um, it is not showing here. I will I will um, share my whole screen. Sorry, for the delay. Um, it is not working to share sound. I am very sorry. So I will go back to the PowerPoint. It was at least here making a very bad noise. Um, and. Um, or have to miss miss the movie. I'm very sorry about that. Um, okay, so un unfortunately we can't hear it, but I want you to realize that these are very unusual earthquakes, and they happen in many times almost daily. 
um, these magnitude about five earthquakes. So you can imagine living through that on a daily basis. Um, of course, this is the this is Hawaii Volcano Observatory. The other video was taken from this tower here. And you can imagine driving up to work in the morning and having an ash eruption taking place just a few hundred meters away. Um, the observatory itself was um, heavily damaged. Um, some of the damage may have been due to tilting of the ground due to the collapse, but obviously journals don't get thrown on the floor of a library just by static deformation. This is obviously there was some strong shaking here, strong shaking in this lab as well. And actually the Hawaii Volcano Observatory has now moved further from the rim with a small field station and most of the people are working um, much further from the volcano. Um, so the, this building was heavily, too heavily damaged to, to continue using or repair. Uh, this is not the only volcano that's had this sort of collapse. Um, this is uh, Island Fernandina in the Galapagos in 1968. And again, there were magnitude five earthquakes in its caldera collapse that were almost daily. And there were some attempts to explain these as being related to um, earth and sea tides, which are plotted above. I just want you to realize that there are other caldera collapses that are similar to this one. OK, so what I want to do is I want to do a, a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis of the caldera collapse earthquakes because it could happen again. And there are, it's not just HVO, but there are other facilities and villages near the caldera. And so we should include this in a, in a full model. So PSHA was started in this classic paper by Alan Cornell. And he said the assumption that the occurrences of earthquakes follow the behavior of the Poisson process model can be removed only at great penalty. He didn't want to pay that computational penalty because he wanted an efficient analytic solution that allow us to explore parameter choices. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, so in this, in this uh, paper, he showed that for a fault and some site or from some area of seismicity in the site, he could calculate the probabilities of different ground motions happening in the future. So what is a Poisson process and a Poisson distribution that he assumed? So a Poisson process is a point process, so things that happen discreetly, like earthquakes, in which the events occur randomly at a constant rate and they are independent of each other. This is something sometimes called a completely random process, but in a Poisson process, how long you have to wait for the next event has nothing to do with how long it's been since the previous event, so it's, it's a hard, very unpredictable process. And there's a Poisson distribution that tells us the probability of a given number of events occurring in the next interval of time for a Poisson process. So Poisson processes are neither clustered nor anti-clustered. Um, these are in some arbitrary time. These are simulated events. And in the middle is a Poisson process. They don't happen on a regular basis. There are some clusters. There are some gaps. These are anti-clustered Earth. Uh, events at the top, they're avoiding each other. There's still some clusters, but they're more regularly spread out. And at the bottom, we have some highly clustered processes. Um, and this is maybe like aftershocks or like caldera collapse earthquakes, where there are big gaps sometimes, and then other times there are many, many events. Um, by the way, there's a lot of variability in a Poisson process. All nine of these time series are Poisson processes. They're just randomly different. Some of them look more spread out. Some of them have gaps and bigger clusters. So Poisson processes have a lot of variability in them. There's, the world is random and it, it varies. So, but one point about Poisson processes is that they're independent and random, the events are independent and randomly occur at a constant rate. So this is a plot of earthquakes per month in California and Nevada over several decades from 1950s to probably about 2000 and 10 or 15, and you can see that there are some months with a lot of earthquakes in them. But every one of these months that has a ton of earthquakes also has a large earthquake, something over magnitude six. This tells us that earthquakes are not actually independent of each other. There's inter-event triggering, which creates aftershocks. We're all familiar with this. And so using a Poisson process is an approximation. And I gave a talk only about the Poisson process last year that you can still find on the YouTube channel. 
But Poisson processes are used for PSHA, and I want to remind people, and I, to be honest, I had to learn this myself not too long ago, how Poisson probabilistic seismic hazard assessment works. So I'm going to use a, what's called the ground motion prediction equation, or sometimes a ground motion model now, from Alan Cornell in 1979. But the basic idea is that um, ground motions from an earthquake, a given earthquake at a given distance, follow a log normal distribution. Um, log normal distributions means that instead of the actual ground motions following a normal distribution, the logs of the ground motions follow a normal distribution. This is a very nice distribution because all of the values that come out of it are positive. There's no negative ground motions. If we, we only have positive accelerations, which is pretty much the way the world works. So in this model, the log of the mean peak ground acceleration um, in an earthquake is equal to this equation where there is a positive relationship, bigger earthquakes create bigger mean ground motions, and further away, the ground, as you get further away, the ground motions get smaller and smaller, And but there's randomness, so there's a, a standard deviation. And so we're going to take a fault with a magnitude 6 earthquake on it, and we're going to look at the ground motions at a site 10 kilometers away. And here we have a, a fairly standard probability of exceedance curve this is given one earthquake. So we know the earthquake has happened. So on the y-axis, we have probability of exceedance on a log scale. And on the x-axis, we have ground motion in G. So here's 0.1 G. Further over here, we have um, you know, 1 G. And so there's, of course, the probability of even zero ground motion, which I've put in here on, even though it's a log scale, um, is of course one. And then larger and larger ground motions become less and less probable. So this is standardly what we see in what we call an exceedance curve. We use these all the time. We'll be seeing a lot of them through the, the talk. So remember, higher probabilities and then higher ground motions. But when we get to high ground motions, higher ground motions are always less and less likely. So if we want to read this curve, for instance, we look at point, let's say point uh, 4G here and we go straight up, we would see that if this earthquake happens 10 kilometers from us, there would be about a 20% chance that we would get a 0.4 G or greater ground motion, which would be very severe and damaging shaking. Okay, we can, in the probability of exceedance given one earthquake, we can include variations in source properties, such as the magnitude, the distance, the focal mechanism, stress drop. There's many things that go into ground motion models these days. So here's the curve I had before for a single magnitude six to 10 kilometers. But I could, for instance, show you the curves for magnitude five, five and a quarter, five, five. Um, actually, these are bigger spacings. So this one up here is magnitude 7.5. So with bigger earthquakes, um, we get bigger and bigger ground motions. And then I can combine these together given the probabilities of different size earthquakes, given the very familiar Gutenberg-Richter equation with B equals one, um, so that every time we go up a unit in magnitude, the larger earthquake is at 10 times less likely. And if we combine these together, we can get a single ground motion of exceedance for any earthquake between five and seven and 7.75. So know that we one nice thing in probabilistic seismic hazard assessment is we can build a lot of stuff into this probability of exceedance given one earthquake. Uh, now we want to factor in the Poisson rate because so we're doing Poisson PSHA lambda. So we start with the probability of exceedance given one earthquake and the Poisson rate of earthquakes. So here's the probability of exceedance given one earthquake. We write this as ground motion greater than X given one. And then if we just multiply it by lambda, we get the rate of ground motion given that rate of earthquakes happening. So here the example is a magnitude six, like before at 10 kilometers. And we assume that in any given time period, whatever our time period is, maybe 50 years for a lot of um, seismic hazard assessment, that the Poisson rate is 0.5. So there's around a 50% chance of having that earthquake in that time. And so this gives us the rate of exceedance instead of the probability. And so this dash line is rate. And to be honest, most probabilistic seismic hazard assessments don't do probabilities. They actually just do rates. Um, 
So for instance, here, this is actually for my offices at Moffitt Field, California, not that I've been there for a very long time. And here, what we actually show is the annual frequency or rate of exceedance. This is from the National Seismic Hazard Model of the USGS. And versus ground motion, um, the black line is peak ground acceleration. And so we see here that we would get close to maybe about 0.8 Gs um, once every 475 years. So the rate here is one over 475. This is the, the recurrence time or rate for the very commonly used 10% in 50 year standard. Um, but again, this generally gets plotted in most things as annual frequency or rate of exceedance. It's very convenient because Poisson rates are linear. If I add another source, I can just add the curves together. We can add different source zones and we can, if we don't want a year, this is annual frequency, we can just multiply to get different time periods. So rate is much simpler than probability, but it has to be a Poisson process. If we actually wanted to compute from the rate, which is the black dashed curve we had on the previous plot to get the probability of exceedance, um, we have this equation here. Um, that the probability of more one or more ground motions is one minus the probability of zero ground motions, which is one to minus e to the minus r. And um, this is this is an equation we use a lot when we do on probabilities from a Poisson model. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the cold era, and I'm going to show you other ways to do this. So we need, for instance, in a to get the probability of ground motion from the cold air, we need the probability of ground motion exceedance for one event. So that's what I'm going to show you first, is how do we get the probability of ground motion for one event? Well, fortunately, we had almost, we had 50 such events. Actually, we have good records and seismograms for 40 of them recorded at the same station. And so this is the spectral acceleration. So this is the acceleration in G. And each one of these lines is an earthquake. And this is the acceleration for different periods. And we can see that for these earthquakes, there was um, a peak of the ground motion was at around a half second. Um, and there were two earthquakes that I'm going to throw out because they ruined the fit that had very anonymously low ground motions. I have no idea how they're magnitude five earthquakes with almost no ground motion, but um, so be it. And so I'm going to look at the acceleration at a half second because that's the, the major acceleration. And so here we have exceedance probability and ground motion. And the black line is just a exceedance curve based on the actual earthquakes. So I can see, for instance, if I go here, that half of the earthquakes produced about 0.4 G or greater. Um, if I look 20% of the earthquakes, produce about 0.5 G or greater. And then I can fit this dashed red line, which is a log normal equation, and I'll use the log normal fit because it's pretty good to these ground motions. So in this case, the ground motion prediction equation just comes literally from having seen many, many of these earthquakes. Often it comes from more of a model that looks at different areas in, in order to get many earthquakes. Okay, so now we need the distribution of the number of earthquakes that happens in the next time period. And remember these earthquakes here, so it's on a magnitude time plot over a few months in 2018, magnitude up to magnitude 5.5. In particular, we're looking at these red earthquakes, the ones that are magnitudes about five that were taking place, as you can see, on a very regular basis um, during this collapse. So the way we get the probability for these earthquakes is to look at the rate of collapses in 50 years. Fortunately, we have records of how often there have been substance, summit substance events where the caldera has dropped that had non-elastic deformation as shown by there being earthquakes. We've had seismometers at, a, at Kilauea caldera since about 1900. Um, there have been 16 summit substance events um, from a table compiled by scientists at Hawaii Volcano Observatory from 1906 onward and the earthquake catalog. Um, six of those substance, substance events had earthquakes in them, so we call them seismogenic collapses. 
And so we model this as a Poisson process, six over 114 years is approximately a rate of 2.6 collapses per year. So sorry, 2.6 collapses per 50 years, 50 years being our preferred um, <clears throat> um, time period for a lot of seismic hazard assessment. The next ingredient is the number of earthquakes per collapse. So how many magnitude four or five earthquakes occur per collapse? Often we try to use a magnitude frequency plot, so number of events. This is for the 2018 collapse versus magnitude, and we hope that it falls on a straight line. So we can use the Gutenberg-Richter distribution. We can see that this data, these are the cumulative um, magnitude distribution, does not follow a straight line. It has this huge bend in it because there's just a lot of magnitude, about 4.5 to 5 earthquakes. Um, so that what doesn't work out. And the magnitudes of earlier earthquakes are much more uncertain. So we, what we did, we tabulate the number of earthquakes produced by each of the seismic collapses. And we're then going to model those using a distribution known as the negative binomial. Um, it's a very useful distribution for this work because it's a non-negative discrete distribution. It's defined at non-negative integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and it's been used before to model earthquake clustering. So in 1924, we had a collapse of about 2.2 cubic kilometers of volume disappeared. And there were 24 magnitude 4 earthquakes, two magnitude 4.5 and graders, but nothing greater than magnitude 5. All of these earthquakes, here's a map here. Here's Kilauea Caldera here. We're assigned to a single location. So remember that in early days, we didn't really have very good um, records. Um, it wasn't, this is the collapse period here in the middle in blue of time versus magnitude. There were only a few earthquakes beforehand and some after the collapse finished, um, but we're only counting the ones in blue in the middle. In 2018, we had 85 magnitude fours. Um, the substance volume actually is now known as almost a cubic kilometers, about 0.85 cubic kilometers. Um, um, and we had 54 earthquakes that were greater than magnitude 5. So we use this data and the data from the 2014 collapse. All the other collapses are zeros for anything over magnitude 4. And we now get the probability of events per collapse. So we tabulate the number of events produced by each of the six seismogenic collapses. So for magnitude 4, it's 24, 4 zeros, and 85. For magnitude 5, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros and 54. And so on a cumulative probability curve, numbers of magnitude 4 events, this is the data. Four zeros, one observation of 24, and one observation of 85. And we fit the negative binomial distribution to it. Fits decently. And for magnitude 5, we have five zeros. And then one observation at 54 events. And again, we can fit a negative binomial to this data set. The data is not very sparse. That's not a lot of data, but we have to do something. That's the thing about seismic hazard assessment. You can't just walk away because you want to wait for more data. You need to give some advice to people who have to make plans on how to build in the area. So we do our best. So now we have some inputs. We have a probability, PU, the probability of underlying processes, in this case, caldera collapses. And it's a Poisson process with a rate. And we also have a response probability, a negative binomial distribution for earthquakes due to a collapse. So the probability of the number of earthquakes, E, given that there's one collapse, is the probability of how the Earth responds to a collapse. R and P are param we have two parameters that come out of the negative binomial distribution. And we also, we, we capped it at a maximum number of events per collapse that I won't go into tonight. That's based on arguments about the um, structure of the volcano and the depth of the magma chamber underneath it. So now we have to combine these two distributions. We, what we really want is a combined distribution that gives us the probability of E earthquakes occurring during the next 50 years. We have our two input probability distributions from the last slide. And what we have is the combined probability, and this is an equation called the total probability theorem. It's very handy. 
the combined probability of something is a sum over the probability of there being how many one, two, three, four, five, or zero underlying events times the probability of the response to that number of underlying events. So we can use this. What we really need now is the probability of how many earthquakes there are if we have more than one collapse. And so we have actually a recursive process that I won't go into in detail, but basically if we know the probability, how many earthquakes we get from one collapse, we can then, if we have a second collapse, modify that first collapse probability PRE1 with itself and get the probability of the number of earthquakes if there were two collapses. And then we can take the number of earthquake, the probability for the number of, with two collapses and use the probability of one collapse again and um, keep summing up until we get the probability for every number of collapses we're going to consider. So if we do this recursive process, um, in GRL hopefully soon, um, for magnitude four, um, we get this curve here. This is the cumulative probability on this axis for the number of collapse earthquakes in the next 50 years. And we see that there was about, this is the number we actually observed in the last 50 years. We see that there is about a 15% chance of observing that many or more earthquakes. That's not too bad because we know that the collapse that happened in 2018 is probably the largest in about the last 200 years. So we wouldn't expect it to be too likely, but we know it shouldn't be zero because it did happen. And this is a Poisson model for that same mean number of earthquakes happening. And you can see it would give almost a zero chance to the observations. So we don't like the Poisson model for this process. Um, for magnitude fives, there's about a 10% chance of seeing the 54 or more earthquakes in the next 50 years. And again, that's a, about, a, a, seems like a reasonable number given that this was a very large and unusual collapse. So now we have the probability of the number of collapse earthquakes in a 50 year time period, and we can use that. So we have the first two ingredients, and now we need a method to do non Poisson PSHA because we don't like the Poisson model for these earthquakes. And again, we don't like it because there are so many of them in one summer and then none for decades. So that's clearly a clustered process. There are some existing approaches for non Poissonian PSHA. Um, often we use simulations, but these are very large scale numerical simulations of. An earthquake happens and we simulate its aftershocks and we simulate the aftershocks of the aftershocks. This is what's called the ETOS model, the epidemic type aftershock sequence model. And here we see the rate of shaking due to the aftershocks of an earthquake on the Hayward Fault. This is California. This is the San Francisco Bay Area. I live about here. And so this is a very computationally expensive uh, simulation process. Um, in New Madrid, we know in 1811, we had three large earthquakes that happened separately. And so sometimes we combine to deal with the fact that these earthquakes seem to cluster. We do deterministic combinations where we say, well, if one happens, all three happens. This is, tends to be very specific. You have to model it, decide what earthquakes are going to happen. So it can be useful in some ways, but, but not for very general problems. So what I want to do is have a computationally efficient method from order statistics that will give us the ability to do non poisson PSHA almost as efficiently as Poisson PSHA. So we have the probability of different numbers of earthquakes happening um, in the next 50 years, and we have a probability of exceedance for one event. So how big the ground motions will be if there's one earthquake. And so if we knew the probability of exceedance for more than one event, so the probability of ground motions if there were, say, two earthquakes or three or four or five or six earthquakes. So in each spot, we would take the biggest ground motion that occurred for those, say, five earthquakes. This is something we don't know. We do know what it is for one earthquake, but we need to find out what it is for more than one earthquake. So this is, again, the total probability theorem. So the probability of ground motion being greater than some value, given the probability of some number of earthquakes happening, is a sum 
over the probability of the number of earthquakes happening. This is what we already did for the Kilauea caldera times the probability of ground motion given that there were exactly n earthquakes. We're doing a sum over n. And this here, this last term, is the thing we don't know, but we can get from a thing called order statistics. So order statistics, think of it this way. If you roll a dice once, a six-sided dice once, you know that there's a one-sixth chance of having each of the six numbers. But let's say you roll it twice and you want to pick the lowest number you got. Well, then that's obviously a different distribution. So order statistics are a field of statistics that give you the ability to get the probability for the largest or smallest or something in the middle, what's called the rank of more than one sample. So we're going to apply prob this to probabilities and probabilities are uniform on zero to one. You know, a probability of 0.2 is just as likely as a probability of 0.4 event. All probabilities are equal. But it turns out that the order statistics solution for uniform samples on distribution one to zero, zero to one, is a known, has been solved. And we would then take the rank R sample from the bottom. So we're, if, we're, if we're looking at three samples rank one, we're taking the lowest of three samples. It's distributed by this fairly messy equation. Um, we can see in it the number and the rank, X is the zero to one uniform distribution. You can see that it's normalized by this integral down here. And fortunately, this is something called the beta distribution. And the beta distribution is available in packages such as R, the statistical package that I really like to use because it's it's free and there's tons of functions available in it. And so let's look at what this looks like. This is now going to be probability density of from zero to one of our across our uniform range. And if we take the one sample out of one thing, well, then of course it's it's just uniform. We get the uniform distribution back. But let's say we take five samples and we ask for the lowest one. So now the lowest numbers become more likely because each sample is uniformly distributed, but the lowest one becomes biased lower as we take more and more samples. If we take the middle sample out of five, we of course get a peak distribution in the middle. This would be the third rank sample from five samples. And if we want to take the fifth high, the highest sample of five samples, it becomes biased towards high numbers, just as the what first rank was biased towards low numbers. The nice thing is this, this all is available to us from the field of statistics. And so now what I want to show you is how I apply orders, use order statistics to transform the probability of ground motion given one earthquake to the probability of ground motion given two earthquakes. So on this axis here, I have the input exceedance probability. So I'm reading off, I'm going to read off probabilities from the probability of ground motion given one event. And I want to get out the probability of ground motion given two events. And this here is the beta distribution for two samples rank one. And so if I wanted to look at the ground motion which had for one earthquake, 50% chance of being exceeded. I go up to the curve and then I go over here and I discover that quite neatly, it would be 70.75 chance of happening now. Because if there's two earthquakes, the chance of any ground motion becomes greater. So then I go to the point where if I went up from, uh, I have to go over from 0.5 here and get to this curve, and I go up from 0.5 to 0.75, I get a point on the probability of ground motion for two earthquakes, starting with the solid line. It's a probability of ground motion for one earthquake. And if I do this for a whole bunch of probabilities with these different blue arrows and I connect the heads, I now get the probability of ground motion for two earthquakes. If I wanted three earthquakes, I would then plot here instead the beta distribution for three samples first rank, and I can just keep doing that. <laughs> and so finally, what I get is if I want the probability of ground motion given a distribution, is the probability of N earthquakes times the probability of ground motion for N earthquakes. And this actually, the probability of ground motion for N earthquakes turns out to be the beta distribution of the probability of ground motion for one earthquake, given the rank, the number of earthquakes plus one minus the rank. 
where the rank is now the number of exceedances. I can look at two exceedances. How, what's the probability of exceeding half a G twice? I don't have to look at only one exceedance. So the probability of ground motion exceedance in a given time period, this is what we give for PSHA, is a sum over the probability of earthquakes occurring times the beta distribution from order statistics, the ground motion prediction equation that we already had, and then the number of exceedances we want. And we just sum this over N, and we now have a very computationally efficient method for non-Poisson PSHA. Um, let's go back to the caldera now. So here for magnitude five earthquakes, collapse earthquakes, we have the probability of different numbers of the earthquakes happening in the next 50 years. It has a mean of about 10, but of course in any 50 year time period, there may be zero, there may be 50. And we have the ground motion model that we showed you before from the seismograms. The first thing I wanna show you is, what if we just plot rate of exceedance in 50 years? This is what is usually plotted in probabilistic seismic hazard assessment. And the black shows the Poisson model for the rate of exceedance in 50 years. And the red shows the rate of exceedance <coughs> for non poisson This was actually done with simulations because there's no analytic method. Well, it was done with simulations. And you can see that they're exactly the same. So if we look only at the rate of exceedance, which is what we usually do, we will hide all of the non poissonian effects. So we need to look at probability. Okay, so now we have the same inputs. We're gonna use the order statistics method. And here is the probability of exceedance in 50 years for different ground motions. And what we see is of course that there's a fairly high probability that there will simply be no ground motion. That zero will take up about 60% of the height of the probability distribution. And that's because there's about a 60% chance that there will be no magnitude five cold air collapse earthquakes in the next 50 years. And the rest of the curve looks like this. And I'm showing uncertainty around it because we have a lot of uncertainty in our observations. And this is a Poisson model with the same mean rate. And we notice that for small probabilities, they're very similar. So often in seismic hazard assessment, we think about 2% or 10% in 50 years for different types of structures. And we can see that you know, the Poisson model is not bad. And that was actually predicted by some earlier papers by Mer Warner Merzocchi and Taroni. But if we go to higher probabilities like 50%, which actually do get used for things like the operating standards for critical infrastructure or tall buildings, that they are quite different, that we would be telling people that with a Poisson model, that there's about a 50% chance of getting to almost 1G in the next 50 years. When in fact, at 50% chance, there's a 50% chance that there'll be no ground motion due to caldera collapse earthquakes in the next 50 years. So at high probabilities, we have a problem with Poisson statistics. It also breaks down um, if we look at things, two exceedances. So what happens, the probabilities of shaking two times or shaking three times. So if we look at two exceedances, we now see that even at small probabilities, now the Poisson model actually under predicts the motion compared to the clustered model, because if there's one earthquake, there's likely to be another one or 50 of them. And so it's likely we will get more ground motion. And for three exceedances, the discrepancy becomes even larger at small probabilities. And again, this is because in the Poisson model, you're likely to get a small number of earthquakes, but you're very unlikely to get a large number of earthquakes. OK, so now we will look at some general problems. I just want to look at how clustering, and I'm actually just going to look at clustering today, affects PSHA. Um, and we measure clustering by what's called the coefficient of variation, which is the mean rate or the mean number of earthquakes in a time period divided by the variance of that. And so when the CV is 1, it is about is a Poisson process. And if it gets higher, which we'll only look at higher, it becomes a clustered process. So here we have a plot where the mean rate of earthquakes is one, and we're gonna look at one exceedance. And the black line is a Poisson model, so a rate of one earthquake per time period and a coefficient of variation of one. And then these are probabilities for ground motion 
for more and more clustered models, two, five, and 10 coefficients of variation. This is all computed with a negative binomial distribution. It's just a toy problem to play with. And what we can see here is if we look at rate one, that there's some pretty big differences at higher probabilities between these curves. We go up to a rate of five, so we have more earthquakes that happen per time period. Um, we see that the curves are now closer together. So what we see is that lower rates and a higher CV or more clustering make non-Poisson behavior more important. We can also compare the plot for a rate of one for one exceedance with now the rate of one for three exceedances. And we see that as we go to more and more exceedances, the clustered behavior becomes more important. So the number of exceedances changes the impact of non-Poisson behavior, makes it actually more important. Okay, so now I want to segue from that toy problem to aftershocks, which can cause additional damage and fatalities. A really tragic case is the 2015 magnitude 7.8 earthquake, um, uh, not far from Assam, um, which killed almost 9,000 people. Um, here's Kathmandu, the earthquake, the main shock was here, and these are aftershocks. And then there was this magnitude 7.3 earthquake. We were actually doing aftershock forecasts for this sequence. They were being released publicly and they were also going to the urban search and rescue teams um, that were working in the area. Um, this magnitude 7.3 aftershock killed another approximately 200 people and injured over 2000. Um, and so aftershocks can be very important and they are part of clustering. Um, aftershocks can actually be more damaging and deadly than the main shock. So the Christchurch earthquake in 2011 was a aftershock, but the main shock was here. It was the um, Darfield earthquake with a magnitude seven, and it didn't do very much, but the aftershocks migrated this direction and the magnitude six Christchurch earthquake, uh, 6.2, happened so close to central Christchurch that this was actually a very devastating earthquake killed um, two or 300 people and very much, especially due to liquefaction, destroyed a lot of their downtown business district. So what about the hazard from aftershocks? So I'm going to, we know that aftershocks are clustered. I'm going to experiment with simulated aftershocks. We're gonna use an epidemic type aftershock sequence model. This was invented by Yoshi Ogata uh, in Japan in 1988. Um, we're going to use parameters that were developed by Gene Hardebeck for California. I'm going to use a magnitude 7 main shock. We're going to allow aftershocks to be bigger than the main shock up to magnitude 7.9, which was true in Gene's parameters. I'm going to look at the first 100 days. So here we have the number of magnitude 3 and greater aftershocks in this model for 100 days after the main shock. And you can see sort of the standard behavior of having many aftershocks near the beginning and then things slow down. Sometimes we see a curve all of a sudden jumps up because there was a large aftershock. This looks like a case where there was a aftershock larger than the main shock. So we get far more earthquakes. And so there's a lot of variability in the clustering of these um, aftershocks. So let's look at how many aftershocks there were in the first 100 days. Here we have magnitude three. We have the cumulative probability. And first we have in black, the actual number, cumulative number of aftershocks of different numbers. There was no case in my thousand simulations where there were fewer than 257 aftershocks. And there were a lot of cases where there were between 257 and about 400. And then there were some cases where there were many more, actually up to 5,000. I'm just going to use here in the calculations of hazard an empirical model. This is just a bunch of splines um, to, to try to get close to this black line. And we can see that a Poisson model with the same mean rate um, doesn't, doesn't look very good. It would mean that there was almost always about 350 to 400 aftershocks, never very many more, never as few as 257. For magnitude five and greater, we can see that the Poisson model actually fits a lot better. It doesn't fit as well as my empirical model, 
but it, it does fit better. And we should recognize that the bigger aftershocks, there are fewer of them, it's harder to see the non Poisonian behavior. So if we want to predict the number of magnitude three earthquakes, we better not use a Poisson model. That would be a very bad model. But if we want to predict the hazard, the question is, do we need to use this empirical model or could we use a Poisson model? So let's calculate it. I'm going to do the hazard from main shock and aftershocks together. So first we have the main shock, which we're going to make a magnitude seven and we're going to say it's 10 kilometers away. So here is the probability of exceedance for the main shock. Remember, we know the main shock happened. We can't have aftershocks without it. Now we're going to put in the probability of exceedance, if there's one aftershock between magnitude three and 7.9, that's 10 kilometers away. So we're somewhat being unfair to the aftershocks because in a real aftershock sequence, if you look at a site, there may be some aftershocks that are closer to it than the main shock was. But in this case, we're putting all the earthquakes at a single point. So this somewhat underestimates the aftershock hazard. So here's the probability, and of course it's smaller, um, because most likely this one aftershock will be a magnitude three, not a magnitude seven, um, of a any aftershock of this range of magnitudes. We now do the empirical, using the empirical distribution of aftershocks, I can compute the hazard due to the true number or expected number of aftershocks. And it's lower than the hazard due to the main shock. Um, the interesting thing is I can also compute this for a Poisson distribution with the same mean rate. And notice that it's actually not too bad. Um, remember this, the rate of aftershocks is very high. And when the rates are high, we see less impact of non poisson behavior. Also for the larger earthquakes, magnitude five and above, we really couldn't see much difference for the Poisson model and the empirical model. And finally, we see the total hazard from the main shock and the aftershocks, which were done by probabilistic adding the red and the black curves. And we see the hazard for the total sequence is only a bit larger than for the main shock itself. Of course, once the main shock happens, we do need to be aware that the aftershocks are quite likely to produce important hazards. Say here is a half a G here, which would be very damaging ground motion has a probability of happening of or greater of about 30 percent. So the once we know the main shock happened, we have to realize that the hazard still stays high, which is why we do aftershock forecasting. Um, it's also true that we don't this would become the aftershocks would become more important if I did multiple exceedances. This is only one exceedance. Um, and it's true that we don't really understand how aftershocks contribute additional damage after a large earthquake. We know the buildings have become weaker because of the damage. The problem is that often building inspections don't take place for several days to a couple of weeks after a large earthquake. And by then the damage that's observed by the engineers actually includes aftershock damage. In the Anch Anchorage in 2018, we had a large earthquake and there were some reports about building damage getting worse during the aftershock sequence, but in no cases did we actually have engineers go back and recheck a building. So we're actually quite unclear how the hazard from the main shock and aftershocks is separated. It could be that damage from aftershocks is actually being included in what we consider damage from main shocks. Um, I just want to point out that if I use magnitude three and greater aftershocks or I do the same calculation with magnitude five and greater aftershocks, the hazard looks very similar. Um, so we don't necessarily need to use all the small earthquakes when we want hazard. We need to use them when we want to tell people how many earthquakes we're going to feel, but we could probably get away with using Poisson models of the largest earthquakes, at least in this toy problem, when we actually want to compute hazard. Okay, to summarize, um, we Andrea and I have come up with a method for computing earthquake probabilities by combining the probability of underlying events. Those could be um, caldera collapses, or it could be main shocks and the earthquake response to a single underlying event, which could be the collapse earthquakes or the aftershocks. Um, order statistics has given us a new method that's analytic and computationally efficient to compute PSHA with arbitrary non poissonian probability distributions. Um, if we just look at rate of exceedance, we'll never see this behavior.
So I think we really need to move to talking about probability more often. Um, the importance of non poisson behavior increases with lower rates and higher variability in earthquake behavior. Our lower rates um, are equivalent to shorter time periods, which are used in applications such as reinsurance, uh, the safety of temporary structures, such as scaffolding around buildings that are being repaired, and during response and recovery operations after an earthquake. So maybe not important for 50-year standards for engineering, but there's a lot of other applications. For one exceedance, the Bazan model is a good approximation at low probabilities for those engineering applications, but not at high probabilities used for operating standards. And this confirms some modeling and a theoretical model done by Warner Brzozowski and Taroni in 2014. So if we go to more than one exceedance, multiple shakings of a building, the Bazan model becomes a worse and worse approximation, even at low probabilities. Um, the numbers of small aftershocks are much more variable than a Poisson model. And computing aftershock hazard, however, may not require using non Poissonian methods. Might be able to get away, at least in this initial model, um, by using a Poisson model. So finally, I just want to go back to some sort of ironic damage from, from the caldera. Um, again, this is the Kilauea caldera, across which I have hiked and love very much. This sign is right outside of HVO where the public could come and visit. And it says this summit caldera was formed in a catastrophic collapse. That collapse actually happened in 1500, but this sign was knocked down by the collapse in 2018. And with that, um, I'll end my comments and be happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for delivering such a valuable and informative lecture on such an important topic on assessment of seismic hazards. Uh, it was indeed a great opportunity and honor for all of us to listen to you. And the Q&A box of this platform is filled with appreciation, comments, and a lot of questions. So with your permission, uh, we would like to proceed with today's Q&A session. So should we, sir? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. You want me to read the questions from the chat or how, how do you wish to do this? Sir, I will uh, read out the questions to you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, how does the varying viscosity of the magma chamber affect the caldera formation process? Ah. <laughs> Now you need someone who's a volcanologist. So um, that is not my specialty. Um, and so I, I cannot answer that question. <laughs> um, the, you know, the caldera collapse we're seeing now is directly over the size of the current magma chamber. So they are linked together. And it was the eruption occurring that you know drained magma out of that magma chamber that causes the collapse. It's all tied together, but I am not an expert on the viscosity of magmas and how how cold air is form. I'm I'm sorry that I that's 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 why I thank so many people from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory and our Volcano Science Center um, because they understand these things and can help me. Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, another question is uh, apart from DSHA and PSHA, are there any other approaches for carrying out hazard analysis? Please to share the standard references if available. All right, so <clears throat> some people try to do deterministic seismic hazard analysis where instead of doing probabilities, they try to say, okay, what is you know, the worst event that might happen? But it's very difficult to define the worst event. And, or they might say, well, what's a reasonable event? And again, you, you're stuck taking choices. So I strongly urge um, the use of probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Um, the, 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 the key reference is Alan Cornell's paper in BSSA, the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America in 1968. And, and I, I do recommend people read that paper. It, um, it's very good. <laughs> Not surprising, he started an entire field of research with it. Um, 
I did also provide as suggested reading a sort of class notes that Jack Baker at Stanford University has put online. And they also that those notes have um, excellent references in them. And to be honest, when I wanted to learn um, about PSHA, that was, a, I found the best reference to, to learn. I also know, and I don't want to suggest people have to buy something, but um, around now, Jack and some other authors are releasing a book on probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And when I wanted to understand, for instance, some of the issues with clustering, um, he was kind enough to give me some early chapters. And I can report that the book is very, very good. Um, so I intend to buy it. And of course, it is also heavily referenced. So it, it, it helped me go into the literature. Um, so I would really... If you start with the Alan Cornell paper, you can also look for papers that cited it. It's probably been cited thousands of times, um, but that would be one way. But I really recommend Jack Baker's notes, which are free as a good starting point. OK, thank you, sir. Uh, so now the next question is, uh, what are the likely aftershock eff effects from a high magnitude earthquake event? Yeah, aftershocks do do vary a lot from event to event. But for instance, in um, the beginning of, actually at the end of 2019, we started having magnitude five earthquakes in the south shore of Puerto Rico, which is a US territory in the Caribbean. And then in early September, we had a mag of 20, early January of 2020, we had a magnitude 6.4. And that earthquake has had, Many, many. It's, it's one of the most productive aftershock sequences for a magnitude 6.4 earthquake. It's probably more productive than, say, 98% um, of magnitude 6.4 earthquakes. And there have been a number of aftershocks that were closer to towns that have damaged additional buildings. Um, this is an area where the construction is not particularly good. And so there has been additional damage. Um, there's been a great deal of um, upset in the community, um, and people made homeless and kept homeless by by these aftershocks. Um, I think one of the key issues with the aftershocks is that they can happen near the edges of the initial rupture, and so in localized areas, their shaking can be stronger than it was actually during the main shock. Overall, most of the damage will come from the main shock, but we can get localized damage that continues to um, affect people. Also, the just the continued continual ground shaking um, creates psychological distress, and that may not seem very important because we often focus on engineering. But if people don't feel comfortable knowing that this is an understood process and that it will slow down with time, and it has slowed down with time in Puerto Rico. Um, they may move away and it may, the area may have trouble recovering because people may be scared to live there. So we do think it's important for what's called social recovery in natural hazards work to inform people about aftershocks so they understand what they're experiencing. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, we have several questions, but due to the time constraints, we could not attend to everyone's question. Uh, we will send uh, all the questions through mail to you. So uh, with this, we would like to uh, end the Q&A session. Now, so thank you, sir, for uh, such an informative lecture on uh, such an important topic of uh, seismology. So now may I request uh, Professor Kayal, sir, who have joined us today, uh, who is the session chairperson, uh, to provide his initial uh, remarks on today's program and insights on today's uh, session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So nice to meet you, Michael. So nice to meet you. Nice. It's nice and to see you. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I apologize for not being, you know, participating in the inaugural session. I was watching the session, but I could not join somehow uh, due to some technical problem. But I have uh, enjoyed the thoroughly enjoyed uh, your lecture now. And I think like last time or every time you enlighten us 
with your huge knowledge and experience. And this time it was on seismic hazard analysis. And I think when seismologists are, you know, far away from predicting earthquakes with time, space and magnitude. So to develop a earthquake resilient society, most useful technique that you have the lab I did with your friends can produce even a larger and how it can also be more dangerous. Men, uh, you can say, which uh, is so much. All right, I just like to say thank you for your kind words and to point out to everyone that there's going to be three lectures by the Global Earthquake Model Group later in the workshop that will give us the chance to learn a lot more about PSHA from some real experts. Okay, thank you, uh, Kyle, sir. Uh, I think he is also having some uh, network issue. Uh, so now, may I request uh, Professor Dapping Chow uh, to provide his initial remarks on this session? Over to you, sir. Hi, Professor Kyle. Nice to see you. I think this is a. Uh, Professor Andrew Michael gave an excellent uh, talk, and I really uh, learned a lot. And uh, I have just a, have one question to you. Uh, I have interest in the vertical distribution of seismicity in, in Hawaii. I know uh, there are some uh, earthquakes in the upper mantle, but uh, can you tell me the focal depth of the deepest events in Hawaii? Yes. So Hawaii, um, we, we, we have just finished and soon will be published a seismic hazard analysis for the entire state. And it is, to be honest, the most fascinating place um, because there are tectonic earthquakes, but most of those earthquakes are caused by say gravity sliding of the, of the, um, the islands are, are essentially falling. They've been built up by the volcanoes and now they're falling. And then we have, of course, the volcanic earthquakes like these called their collapses and also the ones where the magma is forcing its way out. The deepest earthquakes we see for the most part are, are between 20 and about 40 kilometers depth. And they're fascinating in their own right in that it is simply the weight of the volcano flexing. So the weight of the volcano that's sitting on top of my fingers, flexing the crust and the upper mantle. And then you have these 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 flexure forced earthquakes around the rims of the islands. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to say that I loved working on that project um, because it takes us away from this simple, or not so simple, but we're used to plate boundaries, you know, like the San Andreas Fault where the plates slowly move along and just keep doing this. But now in Hawaii, we have gravity and we have flexure and we have volcanic earthquakes and it was very difficult, but it was very a great learning experience for me. What do you mean? Uh, the 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 deepest one could be forty kilometer. I I'm pretty sure that that was yeah. We our separation from shallow to deep was twenty kilometers. My memory was they were around forty kilometers deep. The deepest earthquakes. You also get some. I remember, I remember some papers said uh, that the deepest one could be around fifty or even sixty kilometer. Is that true? It could be. I might be misremembering. Um, I'd have to check. Um, <laughs> there are also, apart from the Fletcher earthquakes, there may be some, also some deeper earthquakes right under the major volcanoes where the magma is coming up from great depth. 
So yeah. yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, sir. Now, may I request respected uh, Saurabhorva, sir, to provide his remarks on this technical session. Over to you, sir. Uh, 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 yes, really, it's a wonderful lecture uh, by Professor uh, Andrew. And uh, always he enlightens us with his uh, in-depth work uh, that we have also. In, he has reflected the same flavor this time as well. Yeah, I have a query. Uh, actually, uh, some comments in the sense there is no words from my side. It's a splendid uh, amount of lecture what he has delivered. But there is a query from my side. That means that particular deformation is embedded with a false scarp, as we have in indicated. Is it so? Sorry. So, so which information from the false scarp? I mean, uh, the uh, the deformation. What you have shown in your video, uh, that ah. is associated with a false scarp. Right. So it is very amazing that if we if we if we think about this caldera collapse, there, there is a ring fault that goes around and there's a plug that's going down in the middle. But those drops in the middle, which started at like a meter high on each day and went to eight to ten meters high, they seem to produce very little of any seismic energy. The, the fault must have almost no shear rigidity. And so the actual earthquakes are coming from underneath the plug and they're related to the release of pressure that allows the drop to take place. They are not slip on fault earthquakes. Um, there are thousands of very small earthquakes that may be slip on fault, but they're not producing very much actual energy. But it was fascinating because each day the small earthquakes ramped up and, um, and then the drop would take place and the small earthquakes would stop for a few hours and then they would start slowly ramping up again. So as a yeah. Truly, truly unusual set of earthquakes. Exactly. And I, I do want to point out, I, the uh, Dr. Zhao is actually correct. There are earthquakes. Most of the earthquakes are 40 kilometers or shallower, but there are some down to 50 and 60 kilometers, but just a few. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, may I request uh, Daniela Kuhn uh, to provide her uh, remarks on this session. Over to you, ma'am. Yes, thank you very much for that talk. That was very interesting. So uh, I dabbled a bit in probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, but uh, not to the depth that you can do that. Um, I've actually not a question to uh, directly to your um, theory, what you presented, but um, I was very fascinated by this uh, lava tunnels where the lava exited at uh, totally different locations than the caldera itself. There I have two questions. One, is it always known where the lava tunnels are so that you know where to evacuate people? And the second question is, um, to the uh, movie you wanted to originally um, show. And there you said that there was a very impulsive event uh, related to the lava running through the tunnel or exiting the tunnel. So there I wanted to ask if you have an idea why that happened. Yeah, so it's, so it's very interesting. The, I mean, we do know that the, what we call this, the East Rift Zone um, is a long-term feature. And it's been very active. The most active parts of the volcano have been along the East Rift. And so we, we, we know to expect eruptions in that direction, mostly. Along this part of the volcano, the lava moves slowly enough that when there, an eruption starts, it is possible to evacuate people safely. Um, people um, in Hawaii, are, are the culture is to rebuild <laughs> when possible. They they accept the the culture accepts that land is is temporary. Um, now on some of the other sides of the volcano, more to the west, there are phreatic eruptions in which the um, the lava can move extraordinarily fast, and evacuation may not be possible, and the eruptions may be more sudden. Those are fortunately more rare. Um, obviously, those sorts of eruptions are far more um, dangerous. 
often the model for the earthquakes has been that the um, the lava essentially going down the east rip, east rip zone is then forcing its way in and pushing itself apart to create the earthquake and then it can come out. But there's actually an alternative model that I find a little more um, appealing, <laughs> which is that the these earthquakes are, are caused by gravitational sliding also. The lava couldn't do enough. Some of the force is caused by gravitational sliding. The entire volcano is built on top of old sea um, bed sediments. So there's a, a weak layer underneath, so it can almost slide horizontally. And so um, Emily Montgomery Brown's model is that actually it's the sliding force and the gravitational force overcoming the resistance on the fort on the fault so that you get the opening mode earthquake and then the lava is allowed to come up. Um, so both models exist, but I, I sort of like the second one a little bit better. Um, I don't know that she's uh, won the conversation yet, but uh, I find her convincing when I talk to her. I'm, I'm very fortunate when we're in the office. So six months before the pandemic, we moved from Menlo Park to Moffitt Field and my office is on the boundary of earthquakes and volcanoes. So I've had Emily and uh, a number of the other um, volcanologists uh, right next door. It's been very educational. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, for such an interesting session. Now, may I request the convener of this workshop, Dr. Shantanu Borwa, sir, to deliver his vote of thanks and say a few words. Thank you very much, Anissa. So, first of all, uh, I'd like to profoundly acknowledge our honorable director of CSR NIST, Durat, Dr. Zeno Harisastri. Uh, for his kind permission and subsequent guidance for this date to be real. His acumen and leadership have benefited the Institute by leaps and, and bounds. A huge shout out goes to our first speaker and chief guest, Dr. Andrew Z. Michael from USGS, USA. Our guest of honor, Mr. G. Tripathi, Chief Executive Officer of Assam State Disaster Management Authority. A special guest, Professor Dateng Zhao from Tohoku University, Japan. Professor J.R. Kyle, former Deputy Director General of Geological Survey of India. Dr. Daniel Akun from North Star, Norway. Mr. Mukul Saxena, Deputy General Manager of NSIDCL, Government of India. And Dr. Soro Burwa, Chief Scientist from CSR and East Durhat. And all other keynote speakers who, in, in spite of their busy schedule, accepted our invitation to join this workshop. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the keynote speakers for their altruistic spirit and volunteering for us for this workshop. I would also like to thank each and every member of the organizing committee for systematically coordinating and making this event a reality. The fact that about 1,800 participants from diverse fields of studies within and beyond the domain of seismology and tectonics registered for this workshop and representing from more than 41 countries brings enormous satisfaction for me as an convener. I thank all of them in this August forum. So thank you very much, and uh, this session is is over. Thank you, thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thanks.